Good morning or good afternoon or good evening. I guess whatever time of the day it has worked out for you as a family to take the time, set aside the time to be able to join with us. We're glad that you're able to be a part of our third week of our online teaching. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's kind of fun in some ways, but of course we all miss being together. So we're glad that you could join with us today as a part of this as well. It really is interesting to me how today's topic, um, it's almost ironic in the title. If you've looked at what the title is, we're talking about one of the crowd today. And as I'm sharing this with you, well, there's only two in the crowd, me and Lynn is here with me helping to video this. Otherwise, the sanctuary and where we stand is completely empty. So to talk about a crowd when there's no crowd around, a little bit weird, but you'll just have to imagine it. We're together. Have you ever seen a street magician at work? Have you ever seen the, the, the trick that they do when they can get you to determine or they can tell you what card you've picked or or any of those interesting kind of tricks and and you look at it and you're just you're in awe of what it is well you know i, I maybe i don't want to burst your bubble but one of the things that you know of course with these kinds of street magicians with tricks and different things like that um, usually it's sleight of hand it's distract you on one side to get you to be able to see what they want you to see. Now, if I had the talent to do it, I probably would have done a, a trick for you today, but I wouldn't have tricked you at all, so it really wouldn't have made any difference. But what's interesting about these, these magicians is if you watch it, I, I watched a show on him one time recently about a, a young man who would go around, and he would perform these tricks on the street and it would always start out kind of the same. He would walk up to an individual or a couple of individuals and he would start with a very simple trick and it was kind of like the hook. He would get them involved in it and before you know it, there was all of these people that would be gathered around as his tricks became more impressive and bigger and, and for me, it was actually almost more interesting to watch the crowd because one of the things that you find is within a crowd, there are all kinds of different people with different perspectives on what is going on. For example, you have the people that were in the crowd that they, they saw what was going on and so they just wanted to be entertained. They just they, they wanted to see what was going on and, and so they joined in, but they were really not involved. Then you had those that they kind of looked and they were saying, oh, this is all a fake. And so they would try to describe or give the reason as to why or how the trick was done. And then, of course, you had some that were in there that, that were completely taken away by what was happening. And they thought that it was some supernatural thing that this guy was able to tap into. And, and it was real. And, 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 well, you know, as I already shared with you, we know that these types of things are not real. But people have a very different perspective. The crowd is such an interesting study. And as you can see, more than likely today is Palm Sunday. Today we celebrate the, the moment that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and was declared the Messiah by the people. And what's interesting about this story, and we're going to read it in just a second, in, in John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19, and I'd encourage you to go there, but one of the things that we find is as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, there was a crowd that gathered. And within that crowd, there were, there were a few different kinds of people. And so we're going to look at these today. We're going to look at the crowd that gathered, and we're going to look at the different opinions of the people that were there, and even transition that to today. And really through the course of this, we're going to ask ourselves the question, which in the crowd am I? So turn with me to John chapter 12, and we're going to read the text for today. John chapter 12, starting at verse 12. And these are the words. The next day the crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. After Jesus was glorified, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. You know, it's interesting, as I was reading this this passage and looking at it, there was this crowd that gathered. And on the day that Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, the people gathered around him and they shouted, Hosanna! And it Praise be to God. And and they even said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, as we look at this, we understand what they were saying. They were proclaiming Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. But it was the Messiah that they wanted. Not necessarily the Messiah that Jesus was coming to be. You see, they were under the oppression of Rome. And so they were looking at at a military might coming in. Someone who would overpower Rome that would lead them to to be able to find their freedom because that's what they were looking for. But that's not what Jesus was coming to do. But what's interesting really is as you look at this story to see the different people that had gathered. Much like the street magician of today when, when there's a show that's going on, there are different people that come with different opinions and different ideas We actually see in here that there were about four categories, maybe could be more, but four categories that that we want to look at today. The first category is the crowd. The crowd, just the big crowd that happens. And I would even simply say that this was the simple crowd. So who were the crowd that followed Jesus on that day? Well, we read in there, one of the things that it said, that the people who had been there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they were part of the crowd. Now, when we consider this, for many years, I always thought, well, Jesus, when he traveled around, he had a group that would follow him. And I heard a lot of people teaching on that too. You know, there there was always a group that followed. And we would often say in that group was the 12 disciples. So our picture or our idea of what this is, is that it was a small number. But actually, when we look at some of Jesus' ministry and some of the stories, we find that Jesus often had a rather large crowd that followed him. For example, one of the stories in scriptures that we read about is the feeding of the 5,000. This is a perfect example of one of those times where Jesus was doing his ministry walking along and people were just there. They heard that he was a part of it and they wanted to come out and see this Jesus guy. But that was one time, right? Well, it's interesting. If you look at Luke chapter 12, verse 1, we see an interesting thing here. Look at what it says. It says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the heroes of the Pharisee, which is hypocrisy. Now, this is a completely different time from when he had fed the 5,000. It's a completely different time from when he rode into Jerusalem. This is a whole different scenario. And it says that in one setting that there were many thousands that had gathered. What an interesting thing to look at. They came out to see the miracle worker. It was the show. It was what was going on. Even in one of our most famous passages in Matthew chapter 5, which is called the Sermon on the Mount, this is what happened. The Sermon on the Mount actually occurred because of the crowd. In verse 1 of Matthew chapter 5, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. And the disciples came to him. And from that flows out the Sermon on the Mount. The incredible things that Jesus taught. 
But again, it says that he saw the crowds. There were many. We had the opportunity to be in Israel last year, and it was amazing to see where they say this was likely the place where Jesus spoke and taught the Sermon on the Mount. And as I stood there and I watched, you could have easily sat thousands of people, and he would have taught them in that setting. Absolutely incredible. So from Jesus in these times, we see that he had all kinds of people. Well, who is the crowd then? Well, it's simply this. The ones who were seeing what Jesus was doing, hearing what Jesus was doing, and they were just wanting to be around it. It was the show. It's like going to a concert. Hey, Jesus is in town. Let's go see the show. And so they would go out wondering, what's the next big thing that Jesus is going to do? And so they would flock to that in thousands. Well, that was Jesus' time. What about today? Well, here's what I want you to do. This is going to be one of those times where I want you to have the conversation in your home setting uh, with your family or whoever is with you. Uh, if you're alone, again, write down your answers. Maybe de decide and, and think about what you think this would be. But the question is simply this. What might being one of the crowd look like today? We saw what it was like in time of Jesus. What would being one of the crowd one of the individuals in the crowd look like today? So go ahead and pause and answer the question. What would it look like to be one of the crowd today? Matthew chapter 15 verse 8 gives us a, a pretty good picture of, of a little bit of what this person may look like. In Matthew 5 18, Jesus said these words, these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. If you remember when Jesus wrote in, they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But do we understand that many who were standing there on that day, in a matter of five days, they would also be yelling, crucify him. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. You know, maybe a way to look at it is, there are those who hear the gospel, Maybe it's those who, who have simply, they sit in church every Sunday. They have for years and they've heard the message of Jesus, but the message of Jesus has never changed who they are. Their Christianity is their social connection. As we're talking during this time, one of the most difficult things that we're experiencing is this distancing as the family, as the body of Christ, we can't be together and it's, it's hard for us to do. And so for many, being part of the crowd means I'm missing my social connection. But rather than the social connection, there's not as much about a personal relationship with Jesus. They're around Jesus, but they're unchanged by Jesus. That's the crowd. And, and actually, we can even tell by Scripture that it says there's many, there are many who are part of the crowd. And maybe the question I can ask you is, would you fall into that category? Have you been around Jesus, but not impacted by Jesus? The next group that we can see in this, the crowd is the large group. But then, kind of like in the, in the scenario of, of a street performer, there are those people that are, are there, that they're there because they're curious. They want to find out more. They want to know more. What are the details? How is he doing this? Well, understand that as Jesus was doing his ministry, it was actually common for people to be there because they were simply curious. Jesus was an enigma at the time. Many people they couldn't grasp who he was. Here's this guy who was doing everything different than all of the other religious leaders. He was not out for his own power, his own authority. He was helping people. He was healing people. He was giving. He was very different than anything else that was going on at the time. And so the question was, what's so different about him? Why is he so they wanted to go and see. They were curious to know more. What was he going to do next? Well, there's a great story found in John chapter 3. 
In John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, we see one of these curious individuals, actually. Uh, and in John chapter 3, uh, that's one of the most famous verses we find in, in all of uh, the Bible that most people know. It's that sporting event, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a, a, a verse that's within a greater context of a story. In this story, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And it says that Nicodemus approached Jesus at night, and they had this conversation about being born again. Now, what's interesting to me is, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus? Understand that it wasn't something new or anything different because the Pharisees often were found in the location where Jesus was at. And we'll talk about this in just a minute. But there was always a secondary purpose. And they always were there when there was a crowd around. But in this scenario, Nicodemus approaches Jesus at night, and from what we can see, he was alone or he was with the tighter-knit group. Maybe the disciples were there. And they have this conversation. And I would say that Nicodemus was there because he was curious. He wasn't trying to trap Jesus. He wanted to know more about Jesus. And so they have this conversation of what's happening. That's the curious. That was, that was in the time of Jesus. But what about today? What might a person look like today who is curious? Maybe it's that person that comes on Sunday. What would they, how would you define a curious person. So I'm, I want you to actually spend time, and again, in your homes, I want you to consider that question. What might a person who is in the curious group look like today? So go ahead and answer that question and pause the tape now. What does a curious person look like? Now here's an interesting thought regarding Nicodemus. In this story in John chapter 3, one of the things that we notice is that at the end of this, Nicodemus does not walk away changed. As a matter of fact, we know that Nicodemus goes back to being a Pharisee. He is still a Pharisee when he leaves. There was no uh, aha moment at this point in time where he gave everything like so many others did. He simply had the time with Jesus and he walked away. Many today are curious. They're looking for something to put their hope in. But oftentimes, they find that they put their hope into what sounds good rather than what is good. They follow what they want rather than what they truly need. In essence, they are, for many, it's kind of like those people that, that follow Jesus because they simply wanted to have the next free meal. When's Jesus going to feed us again? They maybe were wanting a sense of spirituality, but they want it to be more defined by who they want to be. 2 Timothy 4.3 maybe gives us a good indication of this. In 2 Timothy 4, 3, it says, For a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We see this all around us today. There are all kinds of teaching systems that claim to be truth. But when it's broken down to the very core of what it is, it's a little more than simply using God to get what I want. There are thousands and thousands who flock to arena-style churches because God wants to make you successful. God wants to make you rich. God wants to give you all of the things that you have ever wanted. And so we use God in order to get what we want. They're curious as about what do I need to do? What button do I need to do to push in order for God to give me what I want. There's a story of the rich young ruler in Scripture that he came to Jesus. He was curious. He knew. But really, his curiosity was all about, what can I get out of this? People are curious. 
The day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, there were definitely people who were curious on that day. They wanted to know a little bit more about Jesus, but they weren't really ready to go all the way in. Nicodemus was curious, but he, at, at that moment, not sure that he was ready to jump in. But Nicodemus' story doesn't end, and that's, that's the amazing thing about the Bible. Oftentimes, after John 3, we kind of write Nicodemus off because we don't see a change. But when you look at the time when Jesus was crucified afterwards, when they took him down to bury him, we all know that, that Joseph of Arimathea offered his tomb. But in one of the Gospels, it actually says that with Joseph was Nicodemus. Nicodemus also helped in bringing Jesus to the place where three days later he would raise from the dead the tomb. And what, a, what an interesting thing. We don't know what can happen. Being curious is actually a good place to start. So being curious is not an overall bad thing unless we just stay there because we don't see what God is doing. Curiosity can lead to relationship. So you might be in the curious crowd today. Maybe your thing is, I really don't know about this whole Jesus thing. What will I get out of it? Well, Here's my encouragement. Look to Jesus. Look in his word. See what all Jesus is about. And move that curiosity into relationship. And let him be your Lord and Savior. But there's not just the, there's not just the, uh, the crowd, not just the curious. We also see in this story that there's the cynical. Again, when you see this idea of the street performers, a lot of times there's the people that are always there talking about it's fake, it's fake, it's fake. It happens. I also remember a time a couple of years ago that there was a, a sporting event that was taking place and the halftime show was a singer. And during the halftime show, there was a technical glitch. And it became obvious to the nation that the singer was lip syncing, not actually singing. And I remember that following that time, there was another event that was taking place and it was a live event and this same artist was there and I, in the room as we were sitting, somebody made the comment, well, you know, it's not real. They're lip syncing. They're not really singing now. And actually became a tough thing for that, that one artist specifically to overcome because from that point in time, everyone thought that all they did was lip sync. There's a lot of cynics. There were cynics in the crowd when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. And those we see are the Pharisees. In verse 19 of our text, they actually say this. The Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. They didn't like what Jesus was doing. They didn't like it not because he was doing good, but because he was taking away their power, their authority, their fame. People were following him and they were stepping away from this, this religious system that they had even been trapped in. And so they didn't like it. They were losing their power and their authority. <laughs> but understand that the Pharisees were not the only ones who were cynical. As a matter of fact, we read a pretty funny story in the early part of Jesus' ministries as he's forming his disciple group. In John chapter 1, verses 45 and 46, we read this encounter. It says, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. To which the response was, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? <laughs> I love that. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? This was Nathaniel. He was not convinced that Jesus was who he was claiming to be. In the beginning, he was a cynic. <laughs> to see another group, we can turn to the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, chapter 73, verses 1 through 11, the psalmist writes about a group. And he says it this way. He says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant 
when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouth lays claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up the waters in abundance. Now listen to the next verse. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? (laughs) World's not lacking in cynical. People who question God at every turn. So here's the question now to discuss. What would a cynical person look like today? How would you describe that person? What do they look like today? Take a moment and pause that question and discuss what a cynical person looks like today. When we consider today, we can see that it's actually easy to be cynical. As a matter of fact, we are often told that we should question everything. We're often told that absolute truth is no longer absolute truth. There are many today that would question the validity of the Bible. As a matter of fact, I read uh, not long ago that in our culture of today, in our Christian culture of society, less than 50% of our young people believe that the Bible is full truth, that it actually is optional. And so this is for today. So this is what's happening. So many times people are looking at the Bible and simply saying, oh, it's, it's a bunch of good moral stories. I heard it said that Jesus is nothing more than a simple crutch that Christians need because they're weak-minded and they need to put their hope in something. There's no way that this God could do all of these things. He couldn't part the Red Sea. He couldn't cause the sun to stand still for 24 hours. He couldn't create all of this. There's no way. But in Jude, chapter 1, verse 18, Jude says these words. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers who who will follow their own ungodly desires. You see, the Pharisees didn't want to hear what Jesus really had to say because they were afraid that they would lose the power that they held. You see, today... It may look a little bit different, but it's the same principle. Many times we struggle to accept God's truths because it may cost me something. It may require me to actually give up something. Or it doesn't apply to me. I was recently forwarded an article that was written by a female priest. And, and the topic of the article wasn't the issue that I, that I deal with. It was one of the highly volatile topics of today. But what caught my attention was her position on Scripture. In her article, she wrote that the Bible is not relevant to today. And and actually, even though the Bible spoke specifically about this this topic that was being discussed, it was only relevant for the time of Jesus. And and the, the author said, times have changed, therefore truth has changed. The God of yesterday is not the same God of today. You see how dangerous that is? She took Scripture and said, it no longer applies to where I'm at. She was cynical about God's truth, that God said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, and my word will stand the test of time. And here we are in our culture of today saying, I don't think it applies anymore. As I read that article, I could feel (laughs) my anger welling up inside. Who are we to change God's truth? But then the reality of it hit me. 
we are in a time when we are told to consider that there is no absolute truth. It's all relative. One of the cynical group sees God as an option. They may even see God as an opposition. God doesn't have my best interest. I don't know if this God is really a good thing. You understand that there are people that sit in the church week in and week out that hear the teaching and they have this question constantly going through their mind of, I cannot come to terms with God as God. I can't come to terms with that. And they question everything that is truth within God's word. See, it's not necessarily always a flat-out rejection, cynical. But it is taking God and saying, I don't know if I believe that you are who you say you are. And again, this isn't a place where you're stuck forever. This is a place where actually it is good to dig into God's Word. Dig in and find out who God is, who Jesus is, and let Him answer those questions that you're struggling with. And allow him to do the work of change in your heart. But there's another group. One more group as we close. This is the committed group. As Jesus went about his ministry, there were those who were committed to him in his ministry. As we talked about, there was often a large group that would follow him. But at times there were, there were moments where Jesus would simply have the committed core with him, the disciples. And even we read that there were, there were women that were part of that group as well. One of the things that we read in Scripture is that the disciples, they gave up everything to follow him. They were so committed to his ministry, Peter walked away from his boat. Matthew got up from the tax collector's table, the money that was there, and it said he walked away. There are those who are fully committed and all in. There's a story in Mark chapter uh, 10, verses 27 and 28, and, and Peter gives us a, a look at what this may be like. It starts out, Jesus says to him in Mark 10, 27 and 28, Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter spoke up. And he says, we have left everything to follow you. Now, in the beginning, that sounds like a great statement, but someone could even say, yeah, but wasn't he still just part of the crowd? He was, he was there because he was seeing everything that Jesus was doing, and it was an impressive road show. So, man, if you could be on the in crowd of what's going on, wasn't he just considered one of the crowd? Well, actually, if you were to go a little bit earlier in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 and 29, you see an interesting conversation between Jesus and Peter. And it goes like this. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, Jesus asked them, Who do the people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, What about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter is the one who stood up and talked in this point. And he says, You are the Messiah. You're the Messiah. You see, in that moment, this was not Jesus asking to have his ego stroked by the disciples. This wasn't Jesus saying, am I the greatest show out there? Am I the biggest thing? Am I the hottest ticket? This was a question of commitment that he was asking the disciples. Do you see me as a magician? Simply doing fun tricks for amazement? Do you see me as the next meal? Do you see me as some strange salesman trying to sell a religion that better fits your desires? Peter's response showed his commitment to Jesus. No, I don't see you as those things. I see you as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the one that had been prophesied about. You are my God. And I left everything to follow you. So now I ask the question of us. What does a committed follower look like today? 
What do you think a committed follower of Jesus looks like? So go ahead, pause at this point in time and answer that question. What does a committed follower of Jesus look like today? Well, there's many answers that we can come up with. I want us to look at a familiar passage in Scripture as we wrap this up. And it's found in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And actually, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it gives us three simple points that we can look to as being a committed follower of Jesus. And it simply says this. You may not even know this. And if you know this, just kind of say it with me as we go through this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. There's three things in there. These three things are simply this. One who is committed to Jesus, they seek his leading. A committed follower of Jesus will always seek to know the will of God for every decision in life, for every direction that they take. Do we seek God even for the small things? A committed follower seeks his leading. The second thing is that they trust his leading. A committed follower will trust his leading. Do I pray for wisdom? God, give me wisdom and direction in how to do this. And, and I trust what you say. I remember a while back there was a, a bumper sticker that was popular on cars. And it, and it said, Jesus is my co-pilot. And, you know, it was kind of fun. And it was this idea that wherever I go, Jesus goes with me. But as I thought about that, I said, is that really what the Bible asks of us? For Jesus to go with us? Where actually it should say that Jesus is my pilot. I trust him explicitly. Jesus is my GPS. I trust in his leading. And then the third thing that it is, it kind of is closely related to that, but it, it is I allow his leading. You see, I can trust somebody and not allow them to lead. And when it comes to being the committed follower of Jesus, it is this point in time where it says, I am willing to lay down everything that I have. Just like Peter, I give up everything I have to follow you. You may have heard my testimony in the past, but one of the things that I, I said, I will do anything for you, God, but be a pastor. You see, I trusted God that he had the right plan for my life but I wasn't necessarily allowing him to lead until the day came when I had to say to God, I will follow, I will follow your lead. So it's seeking his leading, trusting his leading, allowing his leading. This is the marks of a committed follower of Jesus Christ. And there may be all kinds of other things as well but those are ones that we can grab onto from that passage. The day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, it was quite a stir. A large crowd gathered. Some were there because it was the biggest thing in town. Some were there for the show. Some were curious, wanted to know a little bit more. Some were cynical and didn't like what they saw. And for others, they came to see their Messiah their Savior. So here's my question. Which one are you? Who in the crowd do you more align with? Are you the one that would say today, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and in five days be shouting, crucify him? Or will you be the one that is standing at the empty tomb in awe rejoicing because he is no longer here? He is risen. I pray that we can say like Peter, I have given everything to follow you. Which in the crowd are you? Let's pray. Father, life gives us all kinds of examples. And as we look at this passage, we realize that we can be a part of a crowd, a great big gathering, but yet we may be very different from those around us. For some, maybe this is a time where this is an incredible opportunity to draw closer to you. And for others, this may be a time where there's a lot of soul searching going on. 
For some of us, maybe it's the, the time where we're really trying to determine who am I? What am I? Where do I fit into this whole scheme of things with Jesus in my life? What does it look like for me moving forward? The greatest part of it is until the day comes that we can no longer make a decision, we can always become one of the committed. And I pray for each and every one that is listening to this teaching today, that as they, they go through this and they experience this, that as they consider their place, that no matter what it is, it would draw us to one answer. I want to give you my all. I want to give up everything for you and be fully committed, fully in for you. Lord, use us. Fill us. Help us to be an incredible example of Jesus to those around us. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for sticking around for a minute. As many of you know, this Sunday would actually be the Sunday where, as the church body together, we would be taking communion together. But due to our restraints, due to the times that we're in, we're unable to do that. But I also didn't want to just leave it and not say something. We realize that as the corporate family, we can't. And there's been some questions as to, is there a way that we can, we can do this as a church body? Is there a way that we can all be together somehow and do it? And, and the reality of that is it's difficult. But I do want to share quickly with you. When we look at communion together, it is something that we do. But it's not the what we do that is important. It's the what it is that is more important. When we look at what communion is all about, it is about remembering what Jesus did for us. See, that's the one thing that he said when he was with his disciples. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember the sacrifice that I have given. And so, really, it's not about the, the whole issue of how or when or that we actually do it because sometimes the tradition can become the more important thing than what the message is behind it. But as we look into this week, we realize this is the week specifically that Jesus suffered. This is the, the week on Friday that he was arrested, he was put on trial, and he was put to death. This is the week that Jesus sat down with his disciples and actually did this with them. So this is a time to remember. So in, in your homes, in your setting of where you're at, maybe you need to take a little bit of time and, and find the things that you would need, some, you know, a juice and bread or something like that. And here's my encouragement. For the purpose of remembering in your setting where you're at, take your Bibles, Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30, and read what Paul says. This is the passage that we often use during our communion services. And in your setting, in your home, read through that and remember what Christ has done for you. Because that is what communion is all about. And as you take that time together, may God richly bless your time as you remember and celebrate our Savior.